Okay. So anyway, so what dysgraphia is, is a, is the written expression and the spelling. When they talk about written expression, basically they talking about, they talk about capitalization, punctuation, and syntax. And then spelling. That doesn't give us a whole lot of information, does it? So what I was trying to do with my research was really come up with some really good correlations between what I understood as an OT and what dysgraphia was and where do, where do we go? <clears throat> Forgive me, I've been having really bad allergies and I actually was really upset with myself and I got tested for COVID and I found out this morning it is negative. So it's just the allergies acting up. So if I'm coughing and carrying on, please forgive me today. Um, so the very basic foundation of dysgraphia, which is a very similar, you know, the whole process of sensory motor, visual spatial relationships, motor. And I put memory down there at the bottom for a very with development of the mechanical, the neurological system. The second level of dysgraphia is word formation and sentence formation, and that's language-based. And then the top level is paragraph formation, and that's conversational-based. So is it technical writing, creative writing? Is it narrative, is it explorative? All those different types of writing. So putting it all together, it's a difficulty in one of those pieces of the puzzle that allow you to be a fluent writer. So, Narina asked a little, the difference between dyslexia and dysgraphia, and she didn't add um, dyscalculia, but that's in there as well. So basically, the dyslexia is a difficulty with the reading. It's a difficulty with the intake. The dysgraphia is the difficulty with the output when it's written. You also have in there difficulty with oral expression which would be the dyspraxia of speech. But that is not part of the criterion when they talk about the written expression. But I want to put that in there that oral expression is one of those difficulties that, that does prevent a kid from having a writing issue. Sherry? Uh, yes. Are you um, going through your uh, slides? Because we only see the cover slide. My I wanted to go and answer her question before. Oh, I was okay. Talking. Okay. And the top level is cognitive, and that's really that whole conversational speech. To one of the areas that I wanted to talk about today was form constancy, because I posted something which was a quote out of my book that said children who have form constancy issues also have abstract thought issues. And a lot of people came back to me and said, what are you talking about? So today's lesson is really what is form constancy and how does it relate to abstract thought? So before I move on with today's lesson, does anybody have any basic uh, questions about dysgraphia in general? Um, I do. Okay. Pictures seem to not be an issue, um, especially when I do I spy with this child. Mm -hmm. um, though he is becoming more oppositional and defiant, uh, mm -hmm. just setting up with almost anything. Uh, we actually did um, thoughtful words A through Z. He got through about 10 of them, and then that was it. Um, okay. So there could be much more complex things going on here. You say he has a little bit of a defiantness to Oh, him. extremely. He's learning so many avoidant. Mom isn't much of a help because it's all remote. Um, the setup, we've already asked mom to change him in a quieter spot. So even mm -hmm. the setup to get him in a good, quiet place before we even can get to any kind of learning um, is difficult. Okay. How is he doing in academics? Is he engaging? He's not. Um, you'll usually you see forehead and up. The camera isn't angled correctly. Um, verbally, he can express himself beautifully. Mm. Okay. Has no issue. Um, I do ask him now. Um, he's been to the eye doctor several times. 
They're saying it's a dyslexia, dysgraphia combination, but mm -hmm. she hasn't had an official evaluation yet. Okay. Um, so it talks about the visual... words moving, jumping. Yeah. All right. So visual acuity is good. Identification and three-dimensional respect to pictures is good. Mm -hmm. Oral communication is good. Mm -hmm. You say motor is pretty good as well. Motor's pretty good. He can, I mean, he could build Legos. We go into clay and he's really fantastic mm -hmm. with making little tiny objects. So mm -hmm. I'm not really seeing a motor component. Okay. So when I look at that bottom three, yeah. the one that's left is memory. And the, that is the area that I really think is the deficit for most of the kids that have the dysgraphia as part of their diagnosis or skill set deficit. And one of the, th so any activities that you can do that are going to facilitate memory. So I take their demographics and I create all kinds of game off of their own demographics, trying to have them learn their own demographics. Sequencing will be an issue because they just can't remember the sequence, say of the alphabet or maybe numbers. He um, can say so, the alphabet verbally. But, but he can, just he, because he can say it doesn't mean that he really understands it. Okay. So start in the middle of the alphabet. Yeah, he'll probably get lost. Right. So yeah. he, he can start at the beginning and work through it mm -hmm. because he's learned the repetition in the song. But to really understand where he is, he, if you start in the middle, especially around L-M-N-O, yeah. and, and uh, go forward and then try going backward. And okay. I wouldn't go back forward from the end of the alphabet. I would start like around H and see if you can get him to go back and then go start at M and then try to go back a little bit and work on some memory and sequencing issues forward and back. Also, you can want to start and you can also incorporate number into that and you want to do counting from a certain point forward and back, skip counting forward and back and see if he really understands what rote counting is. Math is his strength. Okay. Math so might be a might, strength. Yeah. Okay, that might be a strength. So maybe what you need to do is you need to work off of the math and create memory games that that link the alphanumeric and the numeric. Okay. Now I also have used symbols for I spy, and he yeah. seems to be able to get the symbols. And, and that would make sense since his visual perception is intact. Okay. So anything that you can do to create uh, a, a remembering of, okay. of the thing. Anybody else? Thank you. Sure. Okay. Then we will proceed on and So what does form constancy require, why does form constancy require abstract thought? And I am Sherry Dutter, your dyscraphia consultant. First thing I wanna ask you is what do you see? Mm, a mountain scene. A mountain scene, anything yeah. else? Oh, and um, geometric cube shapes. Okay. Somebody other than Eileen? Clouds. Clouds, mm -hmm. all right. I see mirror, uh, windows. Yeah, mirror. Mirror, window, something. I'm still trying to figure out how we're getting that image, because to me, it looks like I want to be looking vertical up into the sky, but to get the mountain scene, there, I am not quite sure what the angle of the, <laughs> the photograph is. It's beautiful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, th I thought of like size, a skyscraper and looking up. Okay. That's oh. kind of what I was imagining too. I see horizontal, I don't see vertical. A hex, yeah, hexagon window, I don't know, hexagon mirror or something. And I the top go. windows, the top mirrors, go extend further out beyond the windows 
and that's part of why you get the ref so you see that it's interesting you see the sky reflected in the bottom and the ground reflected in the top but I think the top ones go out beyond the windows a little bit more than the bottom one. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. So when, when, when you're thinking about form constancy, though, it is really interesting because there's a lot of form going on there and a lot of things that you have to recall and have, have a memory of that representation of the visual spatial relationship. How about here? What do you notice? I'm looking down. Okay. At roof a rooftop. It's a building in Holland, I think. A building in Holland. Okay. Yeah, I think it actually exists. So I'm seeing the, the cubes yeah, and then a building behind it. Yeah. And you probably have been there, haven't you? <laughs> I think I have. <laughs> <laughs> I see it as over three different overlapping images. I think it's a bit overwhelming. Well, it's a oh, mirror like image of each <laughs> other, the buildings. That one yeah. building is a mirror image, distorted. Yeah, but they are two distinct buildings. Yes. Because the finish is different. There's wood on one and metal on another at the very tippy tops of the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, why is the top of it black? You know, because it's so looking out of a window from another, the building across the street, looking mm -hmm. down at it. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. But think stuff. about what, what you were able to deduce from all that was that concrete thought was that abstract thought i think it's abstract thought yeah, yeah. oh i'm sorry yes very much abstract thought here's another one what do you see now okay playground. Playground. Playground, maybe a school with somebody walking in the distance. Yep. Well, this one I happen to know is somebody swinging on the swing and just the way that the... Oh! Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> yeah, awesome. that, one, that one was uh, freaky to me when I saw that I'm like oh my gosh and there were several pictures of that one um, when I went looking this morning that's really so, good and then here's the last one <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so you can think Halloween with that one but what is it it foam on top of beer yeah Maybe or it could be juice that came out of one of the dispensers that creates foam too. Yeah, yeah. apple juice yeah. that was shaken up and poured. Yeah, because yeah. it's not a lot of foam. It's not like no. if she made it, it would it would cover the top. But yeah, some yeah. kind of liquid with foam on top. Iced yeah. tea maybe. Yeah, or but beer. think but think about what you just had to do there. Is you had to have some kind of relationship between what you saw and what was actually there. So what I'm trying to get at with you is thinking through what, what kids see and what their interpretation is and how that relates. So when I, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences here between concrete thought, abstract thought, and then we're gonna talk about some of the components that create that abstract thinking. So who am I? So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sherry Dutter. I'm an occupational therapist for the last 25 years. I have a private practice. I work in uh, the school system. I have my own business. It's me, myself, and I, so I don't have a huge staff that I work with, but I kept getting this question from several of my parents, and that was, how can my child read and not be able to write? So I really was trying to delineate what I was doing with handwriting 
how is that related to the reading? How is it related to writing? What is the whole gamut? So I was really trying to just delve into the learning process and really be able to answer that for that parent. And what I found is that I have a mild case of dysgraphia myself. And I'm not necessarily that I'm, I'm really, it's spelling that hits me the most, but I'll tell you what, when I've tried to put what sentences on paper, I read them to myself and I go, hmm, that is not the right order. So my syntax is, can be really way off and it has taken me writing the book, doing writing every week to really be able to overcome some of that contextual conversational speech in, in written form. So I've been, I was terrified of it. And don't know exactly how I got through a master's degree, but I did it. But and my VIPs are in the picture there, my husband, son, and daughter. That was taken several years ago. My son is now taller than me. My daughter is in grad school. My husband also has his own business. So very much the entrepreneurial kind of family. My son also has his own business now too. He's out of high school. Went from high school to uh, being a self-employed crazy kid, but I love him anyway. Um, I'm going to not look at you for this slide because on the big, big monitor, I can actually read these things on the, the little screen. I cannot see it. So um, what is the definition of abstract thought? A variety of everyday behaviors constitute abstract thinking. They include using metaphors and analogies. So. How many of our kids that we see with these learning disabilities get metaphors and analogies? <laughs> I mean, you're exactly right. Sometimes I don't get metaphors and analogies, especially these new ones that the kids are coming up with. But, you know, that's, that's beside the point, right? Understanding relationships between verbal and nonverbal ideas. Well, they don't even understand nonverbal cues, let alone nonverbal abstract thought on paper. Um, spatial reasoning and mentally manipulating and rotating objects. So this is really where the form constancy comes in is they can't understand the difference between with rotating objects. So I want you to pretend that you've gone to the refrigerator, you open the door and you go to get a carton of milk and you cannot find it. Because when your child put it away then the last time, they put it away on its side and all you can see is the very top. Do you see where that rotating the shape can really confuse a kiddo who maybe has that concrete thought to them and they can't abstract the fact that they lift up the, the bottle, voila, there is the milk. So the last part of the definition is complex reasoning, such as critical thinking, scientific method, other approaches to reasoning and thought problems. Does that, does everybody agree with that, that definition of abstract thought? And that came from a psychology uh, art article that I have found. And I thought it was very concrete and distinct and really was a thorough answer to that question. So can anybody answer this question? At what age is abstract thought developed? Eight to 10. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I know with perspective taking, that comes in like around age four in a typical kid, but some of the kids with autism, it comes in really late. And that might be some of the abstract thinking with that. Mm -hmm, exactly. What the research, what the research article said to me was 11 to 16. Wow. I think one of the things that's happening with education right now, and forgive me, those of you that were from out of the country, but the United States with the Common Core, they're pushing for that abstract thought being earlier and earlier and earlier, and these kids can't even do it. So what I'm talking about when I'm thinking of that is word problems. And then it was the question at the end of their homework is, well, how did you figure that out? Mm -hmm. And they're going, I don't know. 
So I, I think that we as therapists really need to help teachers acknowledge that maybe they're pushing that question a little bit too soon and and forcing that and i know some teachers just don't have them answer it but that's not doing them any good either trying to help them process through it even before age 11 will help develop the abstract thought so i'm not necessarily a proponent for don't do it I'm a proponent for, let's try and find supports to help them. And I all, I'll go back to memory, I mean, help the memory build it so that they can figure it out on their own. All right, so what's the difference between concrete and abstract thought? So basically what the article said was, concrete thinking is being able to tell the perspectives with the five senses, where abstract thought is really taking ideas, symbols, and intangible thoughts and putting them to together to make something concrete in 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 thought process so does i use the word wrong concrete right incorrectly so did that make sense does does that does that reflect your understanding between the difference of concrete and abstract thought or am i missing a piece that you're thinking I think experience. Ah, very good. I love that. I love that. I've had kids severe dyslexia and dysgraphia, but they were world now. I mean, they traveled all over the world. They were able to pull their experiences and rationalize certain things and um, answer questions. And that is one of the things that with my, um, co-author for my next book and I are really looking at is experience over time will improve the ability to abstract thought earlier than age 11. All right, skills that are required for abstract thought. Now, this is going back to our understanding of what the psychologist is doing when they're looking at an IQ. And that is where they're getting this information. So skills required for abstract thought are mental object rotation, which really is the form constancy, mathematics, which is part of that is form constancy. My husband's home, forgive me, welcome back. Yeah. Bye. Higher level language usage, application of concepts and our particulars, high levels of intelligence and creativity. Do you have any concerns about Thoughts about that slide? T says that she can only see the cover slide. Can you see? I think um, that was old. That was from a, a, several minutes ago, and you fixed, okay, you fixed okay. it since then. All right. I'm just making sure we're good. Abstract thought and learning with disabilities. They have difficulty with metaphors and analogies. They see things literally. I think we are, are aware of that. Lacks the ability to solve problems. I think we're, uh, we, we would all agree that that's, that's a, a fact with a lot of these kids. All right, now we're gonna transition into the visual perceptual thing. Does everybody remember this hierarchy? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So you've, you've drilled it. We don't have to go through it. Mm. Okay. So this was from an OT journal article that I found because I've never heard this term before as I was looking uh, back through my research and I had forgotten this one. Abstract visual form system is where you're taking your thought and you're preforming it in your mind and you're abstracting the process of recognizing the forms that you see in your environment. I don't know, is that term, is that term new to people? Because yeah. I had forgotten yes. it myself yes. and, and I thought, you know what, we're going to pull it in because I think when I was looking back at my, my quote that I made, I was really trying to say that abstract thought is a combination of these three pieces, and it's the abstract visual form system, 
And that is form constancy, visual closure, and visual figure ground all combined together. So form constancy is the recognition of forms, objects at the same in various environments, positions, and sizes. It allows a person to make assumptions regarding the size of an object, and it enables a person to recognize objects despite the differences in orientation and detail. We should all agree to that, correct? Yes. Man, I could tell the allergies have been kicking up today. Okay. Visual figure ground. The differentiation between foreground and background forms and objects is separate essential data from distracting and surrounding information. And you can attend to one aspect of a visual field while perceiving it in relationship to the rest of the field. So really looking at the different shapes on shapes and things like that. And then visual closure is the identification of forms and objects from incomplete presentations, mentally completing the image and matching it to information previously stored in memory. Does that make sense to you? All right, I'm going to stop the share for a moment and make you guys bigger again. And I'll probably have to rearrange everything in a little bit. Move you guys over there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, pull you out into breakout rooms. You'll be in a group of two for about five minutes. And what I want you to do is I want you to take a look at the idea of the abstract thought and form constancy. And I want you to pretend you opened a refrigerator and tell me something like discuss a little bit about how form constancy and abstract thought are going to play a factor in our children when you go to ask them to get something. Does that make sense? Cindy is posting an article from AOTA. So I will have to- it's about, uh, the, about the uh, visual perceptual pyramid, Warren. Yeah. Th that's the okay. original article, but it's just, you know, okay. if you just put Warren visual perceptual hierarchy, you get 500 images of it, plus the reference to the article. So I was just throwing yeah. the article in there. Thank you very much. Does, before we go out into the breakout room, does everybody know how to save that? If you go to that three dot list down at the bottom and hit save chat, it will save the the chat um, so that you'll have that reference later. It'll save it in your Zoom file. Um, so your computer will auto generate a Zoom file. I don't know if you figured that out by now, but it'll auto generate a Zoom file. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going to have groups of two and one group of three. Now breakout rooms. And all right, so you know what you're going to do? You're going to talk a little bit, go open, pretending you're open your refrigerator. You're a child with a learning disability, say the dysgraphia, the dyslexia. You've been told to go in there and get something. How does the form constancy and the abstract thought impact what you might see when you go to the refrigerator if something's not turned the way you normally would see it? Do you understand what you're going to do? All right. I will give, bring you uh, back in about five minutes. Um, T said she has to leave in um, about four minutes. So if you aren't able to participate the whole time, I'm understanding. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Open all rooms.
Shelly shared with me her thought on um, the breakout room. What what did it was everybody else's thoughts on the breakout room? Is that a do you like that that idea? Do you not like that idea? I love it because I can push into a class for a remote and then I can uh, chat the teacher. Can I do a breakout room with my child? We'll go over what you just taught and now I'm working individually or I could pick up a small group of my kids in that class. So I do okay. like breakout rooms. All right. So you're actually using the breakout room as a treatment tool as well. Yes. When I'm pushing into the classroom. Okay. All right. Remotely. All right. And what did you think of the breakout room just now? That Great. I, I liked like it. That? Yeah. I think it forces us all to participate a little bit more. So that yeah. definitely has value. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what you talked about. So is anybody willing to share with what you talked about when you, with that assignment? Well, Eileen and I were talking about trying to verbally create discrete components to look at. I mean, I'm paraphrasing now what we said, mm. you know, so for example, if they were looking for something to say, to sort of help the person narrow down where they're looking, like say second shelf on the right, or to, if you know that it's a distinct appearance saying something like, look for the red bottle, um, you know, something that takes it away from actually having to see the form, but looking for another component about it that doesn't have to do with that, mm -hmm. that, the visual constancy and all that stuff. So okay. that, that, that was our thought. Well, I love it, off of that, um, you know, when we were discussing it, you know, one of the points that Edgrad brought up is while we say to look for the milk, um, what happens when the milk is not in the form that you're used to? And that's the constancy part. So not only is it not, you know, it might be turned in a different direction, you're seeing it visually, but it's not in a carton, it's in a glass container. Or um, we moved it and, you know, there was a small leak in our container, so we put it into a Rubbermaid pitcher. And you can mm -hmm. still see it, you know, it's not, <clears throat> but it no longer looks what you expect it to be. Mm -hmm. and so then you just look beyond it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? We were just talking in our group about how um, it's far more on the memory that we rely almost about 80% on memory of the mm -hmm. form, the shape, the color. And if that's changed or if it's been put in a different location, we're trying to use past experiences to influence what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and that was far more than I'd ever realized actually until that point. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that you brought that up because I really, my personal opinion, and it's a personal opinion because I can't ha say that I've done enough scientifically based research, is that 90% of the problem with children with dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia is memory. It's a memory issue. It's not necessarily a computation issue or uh, a really the visual motor uh, issue. It's more the memory. It's they just can't remember what the letter is and how to use it, what the word is and how to use it, what the symbol is and how to use it. Um, once it's in front of them, they could tell you it's a, an A, a plus sign, an equal sign, uh, uh, the word cat, but to pull it out of their memory and be able to use it, it's not there. So for those that are having visual spatial issues, they're going to definitely have the dyslexia issues, but those who ha don't have really a dyslexia issue, it's a memory issue. And the other part of the the piece of the puzzle with the motor, what I have found in everything that I've done as far as research goes is if there's a motor issue, it gets kicked out of this category and gets put into another neurological category. So that supersedes the issue. So if you've got a kiddo with autism or cerebral palsy or ADHD, they get thrown into other health impairment according to the classifications because it's no longer 
the dysgraphia is no longer the primary problem. It's the dyslexia the, or the, the autism. ADHD, the autism, the cerebral palsy, that's the primary problem. And that's where the motor problem comes in. And the motor problem is impeding their ability to write. But that's more of the reason for the difficulty, where if it's a true dysgraphia, it's really a memory issue. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does, absolutely. All right. So are any of you interested in- uh, Christy, you have a question? Sure, Pat. Question. Um, last September, I, you know, for the first time in my career, started to work, work with this middle school age group, fifth through seventh grade. And I see a lot of these spatial difficulties, especially impacting academics more, and you know, the gap continues to get bigger. And I talk to these kids, try to find out their interests, like what, what do they like to do? What are they good at? Of course, this video gaming is just consuming our children. But then when I think about what's required in these video games, there's a lot of these spatial components. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with how, um, you know, like the, the 3D dimension, like they can see a character and know that it's that character or they see a partial, you know, something coming into the picture. Like how do we have this breakdown then between things that are so motivating to them to shapes to letters, words, and numbers? I think it's the presentation. Hmm. So because a game is facilitating that constant dopamine release and they're getting that reward from the dopamine, they're not getting that in the classroom. So when they're not getting that, that motivation to, to have that release. Does, so I think it's the, it's the presentation. Hmm of the way we're teaching today and the the kid if you notice the kids that really get engaged in education find some way of finding some video game um have it have you ever heard of tv teacher mm -hmm. i think eileen you would have heard me talk about her before yeah but and i also i i know the program yeah. So yeah. the TV teacher uses the computer to teach how to form the letters. And you said that you, I believe you said, were the one that said that you were learning without tears certified. Am I right? Christine? I'm also certified in. No, it wasn't you? It was somebody else. I'm sorry then. Yeah. No, but, but I'm also certified in that. Yeah. But they, the letter formation is essentially the same, but they're using a different approach on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where, with the whole visual spatial thing, that's where it comes into play it, with the, the kids is where do you put the letter on the piece of paper? And ch yeah. teaching them that delineation is half of our battle. And once they have that down, they can figure out where what to do next and remembering what the letter should look like is is you know so it still comes back to memory so christy to answer your question they really need to be motivated to learn so finding a way to create the motivation um i i do like the games in typing.com which is facilitating keyboarding i realize that but when we're getting into that middle school era I use a lot of compensatory strategies where I will have them have a discussion with me and I'll record it on my phone and then we'll do a playback of creating whatever it is they're going to write that day. So then it's okay. So you're going to write, we've talked about apples today. We've talked a little bit about what apples look like and such. A, I'm going elementary, I think a little bit, but you'll get the idea. So we take what they've written, we'll write it out in sentences. So then I'm, I use note cards a lot. So then I take my note cards and I will write, I will do the writing initially for these kids that are struggling with getting sentences out. I'll do, break it down, whether I'm doing a one word or a whole sentence. 
So if I'm doing one word, then they're putting the sentence together. If I'm doing a whole sentence, we're, I'm mixing the sentence order up and then they're putting it in order of the paragraph before they write it. Does that help? I also talk yeah. about writing, say that again? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also talk about writing binders where I will create binders for the kids that have verbs, it'll have nouns, it'll have adjectives, it'll have adverbs, and I'll have resources for them. And I'll create it like a three ring binder to start with. And then over time, we, when they're permitted to, we can transition it to a digital folder in their, in their phone. But when they're not... I say, so I had a second grader who definitely has some dysgraphia. And I'd say the biggest component that helped him was having a word wall folder. You know, the teacher actually just took a manila folder and taped all the, pa the paper inside, just one big long sheet. And the kid had it in his desk and he was constantly pulling it out to flip it open so that he lost that fear of properly spelling things. Because of course he was a perfectionist too and knew when he hadn't spelled it right, but didn't know how to spell it right without a reference. And then when we went to um, online learning, he was so struggling and we had this big, huge IEP meeting. And I asked, how is he using his word wall words? And the parents were like, what word wall? Because that simple daily resource hadn't been communicated to the parents at home. And that just, just having that right next to him and always available made a huge difference. That and also transitioning from one grade to the next yes. over the year where it was last year's word wall, it wasn't transmitted to this year's teacher. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So for right. him, it was fortunate to have the same person on the IET, IEP team from last year. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry I interrupted. I just, that no, was no, so helpful no. for that kid. And no. yet it's such a simple strategy. Yeah. And you mm. can create it so many different ways. Um, I will include math formulas in there for these kids who are trying to understand pre-algebra and stuff. Does that, does that help, Christy? Yeah, it does. It's just, it, it's something that I've been trying to figure out, you know, the, the bigger picture of not, um, but no, I, I totally agree. It's a mm -hmm. lot of accommodations that, you know, yeah. Mm. Learn at that age. Art Thank is a all. big, art's a big factor with me. Um, we used to play games I use my um, iPhone as a second camera, and mm -hmm. they had to figure out what I was drawing, and they would copy it. So we first learned how to make a frog, a turtle, a tree. Uh, we added background. We started talking about stories. And the last week of school uh, in the spring, they had to write a paragraph. But their memory was there. Each one was slightly different. We gave them the lead sentences. Um, parents were uh, very supportive in that group. Actually, the one boy that I'm still talking about was in that group. So, but they liked drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does everybody does everybody know how to use their their, their camera as a document reader? Yeah. Yeah, you okay. You could get a snake and then you can hold it directly down yeah. your iPhone. Yeah, I, I just have a big tripod that I use. Okay. How does yeah. a tripod work? I, I it's doing pretty good. Like I have it set oh, up. Oh, okay. Way. Yeah, or, my clips onto my desk. Or you can have it that way. I also have a whiteboard behind here that, that I can use. That's why I have the big tripod. Okay. Because I, I was also doing um, sticky notes and stuff on the, the whiteboard. The whiteboard doesn't work too well unless you're getting directly on it mm. with, with stuff. So on an angle, it doesn't work so well. You can't read it. But um, directly in front of it, it's, it works much better. So I also purchased a um, portable whiteboard that I can hold and do writing and things like that. Yeah. That um, 
helped. But what I found with that one is it is a wet, not a dry erase, but a wet erase. And so I wasn't able to use it as fluently as I wanted to. So be careful if you purchase one. Um, I did get it from Construction Playthings. I don't know if they have a, an international branch or not, but, but if you're gonna get one of those, they do have small ones that you can hand held, hold, but um, make sure you get a dry erase, not a wet erase. Mm. Okay, so let's go back to screen share. And... All right, so the references, let's see, can I get you guys to, there we go. Now I can see you. Um, okay, so those are the two uh, articles that I referenced today. And I can share them with you then. Um, any questions before I finish up? All right, so. I'd like you to imagine your classroom running with fewer discipline, disciplinary distractions. Classroom management, are you using visual, auditory, kinesthetic activities? Are you, as OTs, part of the whole classroom environment? How about if we improve the potential of all children? Are you ready to learn a little bit more?